morning, Faith Community Church, and happy Palm Sunday. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We invite you to worship Jesus with us with your whole heart. Come on, let's just all do it together. Let's praise the name of Jesus, church. We worship you, Lord. We celebrate you, God. We honor your name, Jesus. Come on, church. All together now.
let's just continue to praise his name. Let's focus on Jesus right now. We thank you, Lord. Come on, church. We praise you, Jesus. Come on. nothing the king of all kings came to serve washing my feet covering me with your love if more of you means less of me take everything yes all of you is all I need take everything yes you are my life and my treasure the one that I can't live without here at your feet my desires and dreams I lay down oh, Here at your feet my desires and dreams I lay down Come on If more of you means less of me Of me, take 
have it all, Jesus, take it all, Lord. We praise you. We praise you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We thank you, Father God. We honor and bless your name, Lord. There's no name like the name of Jesus. We lift up your name, Jesus, above all things. We worship you, Lord. Come on, church, just focus on his name right now. Just focus on his name right now. We thank you, Lord. We honor you, Jesus. We praise you. No one. 
thank you, Lord. We praise you. Lord, we honor you. We bless you. You are deserving of all of our praise. We worship you from the bottom of our hearts. Lord, I thank you that even though the music ends, our worship continues, Father God. In an attitude of worship, Father God, we will have ears to hear your word, Father. And Lord, I thank you that each and every single one of us will receive that word and allow it to transform us from the inside out, Lord, so that we may look more like your son each and every day with everything that we do, Father God, with the words that we say, with our behaviors, Father God, with the actions that we perform, with our deeds, let, let it reflect your son. And Lord, I thank you that as the week goes forward, Father God, each and every one of us, each and every one of us will have a focus on Jesus and remembering what this season is all about, remembering this holy week, Father God, leading up to Good Friday and leading up, Father God, to his death and resurrection. Let us focus on Jesus each and every day, Father God. We thank you for your son. From the bottom of our hearts, Lord, thank you. We honor you. We praise you in church if you agree. In Jesus' name, say amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and happy Palm Sunday. Thank you so much for being with us as we open up Holy Week while worshiping together. We're really excited to have you here. If this is your first time worshiping with us this morning, welcome. My name is Sarah Comis, and we're glad that you're here with us. We would love it if you'd comment down below so that we could greet you personally and interact with you a little bit throughout the service. If you'd like to receive more information about our church, you could visit our website at faithcc.com, or you could even go to your app store and download our church app by typing in faithcc space NY. And while you're on our church app, we would love it if you'd fill out a communication card so that we could keep you up to date with what's going on in our church. In just a few moments, Pastor Gary is going to come up to receive our offering so that everybody here at Faith Community has an opportunity to give. For those of you who have already given online, I want to thank you so much for your consistency and your faithfulness. And for those of you who are going to be giving during this service, I want to thank you so much for your generosity and your obedience to God. You could give online through our secure platform by going to faithcc.com slash give, or you could give through our app if that's the method that you prefer to give through, or you could type give, text give to 718-400-6696, and you could do text to give. Or for those of you who just want to write out a check, you could find our mailing address on our website, and it'll appear on our screen right now. Once again, happy Palm Sunday, and have a wonderful worship service. Thank you once again for joining with me today as we dive into another service here at Faith Community Church. I'm Pastor Gary Comas. In just a moment, we're going to receive our offering as we normally do at this time in the service, and that will give us another opportunity to support the mission here at Faith Community Church, which is transforming individuals and families through the gospel into empowered followers of Christ. I pray your life is empowered today by the Word of God and the Spirit of God. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul reveals to us God's intent for the cross of Christ. You know these verses. Let me just share a few of them with you. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God. In other words, this whole idea of redemption was really God's plan. It wasn't man's idea. It was God's idea. And so Paul said, all of this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. The cross of Christ is the place where reconciliation begins. And Paul said God gave each and every one of us, he gave the message of reconciliation to you, he gave it to me, gave it to us, so that we can begin to share with those who need a relationship with Jesus, this message of reconciliation. And that's why we give. 
We give, number one, because we're believers, it's the right thing to do. Number two, we want to promote the gospel and share the message of reconciliation with those who need a desperate relationship with Christ. I want to thank all of you who have already given online. You guys are a blessing. Thank you for your consistency and your faithfulness. Those who are giving in the uh, offering right now. Thank you for your generosity as we pool all of our gifts together, both large and small, so that we can continue the ministry here and the message of Faith Community Church, which is transforming individuals and families through the gospel into empowered followers of Christ. Let's pray as we take our tithe and offering and uh, present them to God. Father, we thank you we honor you. You are the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. We thank you, Lord. You're the greater one and we are the lesser one. And so we bring our gifts to you. We ask, Lord, that you would use it, multiply it as we continue to preach and teach the gospel within our communities and beyond. Father, I pray for all of those who have given into this offering, whether they've already done it online or doing it now, I pray that you would meet their needs, Lord, according to your riches and glory. Thank you, Father, for meeting the needs of this church as we continue to honor you together. Bless them. We honor you. And we thank you for it. And everybody in agreement said, amen and amen. You can have it all, Lord. Every part of my world. Take this life and breathe on this heart that is now yours. You can have it all. Every part of my world Take this life and breathe on This heart that is now yours Oh, the joy I found Surrendering the feet of the King who surrendered everything and so the peace that comes when I'm broken and undone by your unfaithful There's no greater call There is no greater call 
Today we celebrate the grand entrance of Jesus riding into Jerusalem. Although this event was prophesied by Zechariah some 400 years prior, Jesus did not plan that event this day, nor was it staged. The crowd exploded with spontaneous praise and applause. There were shouts of joy and cries of cheer everywhere as they hailed Jesus as King. But as exciting as this was with all of its pomp and ceremony, this was not the purpose of his journey. Luke said it this way in Luke chapter 9 and verse 51, Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. That phrase, he set his face, means with fixed purpose in the face of difficulty, and danger. The message version reads this way. When he came close to the time for his ascension, he gathered up his courage and steeled himself for the journey to Jerusalem. Remember, Jesus said it this way in the gospel of John in chapter 10. He said this, he said, no man can kill me before my time. No man takes my life. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to raise it up again. I've received that from my father. By going to Jerusalem, Jesus intentionally puts himself in harm's way. He knows what he's doing. He's beginning to lay down his life. He knew as he entered Jerusalem that before the week was out, those cheers of Hosanna would morph into jeers of crucify him, leading him to his final destination, the cross of Christ. Jesus said this in Mark 10, he said, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now we've all heard the term before that there's power in the cross. 
of Jesus Christ. And that's true. The cross of Christ is not only the cornerstone of Christianity, it is the central story throughout Scripture. It redefines power in the kingdom. It inaugurates a new and everlasting covenant. It not only conquered sin and death, but disarmed powers and authorities, putting them to an open shame. The cross of Christ is substitutionary, offering redemption, reconciliation, and restoration for all who would receive. It's the message and marching order of every believer. I'm Pastor Gary Comis, and I want to talk to you today about reconciliation, God's intent for the cross. We're going to take a look at some familiar scripture. We're going to begin with Romans chapter 5, and we can see throughout these verses, um, the Apostle Paul drills down into the meaning uh, and the why of reconciliation. So let's take a look. We'll begin here, Romans chapter 5. Let's start with verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. The reason for reconciliation, as we just read in some of those verses, um, is simply this because we were weak and we were without strength. And that literally means that we were worthless and useless and helpless and hopeless and destitute, powerless and enemies of God. We were spiritually unable to help ourselves. And so we needed to go to God. We needed to open up our lives and recognize that we can't save ourselves, we can't heal ourselves, we can't deliver ourselves. And so we need to go to the creator of life in order to experience true life, eternal life. So we are reconciled by God through the death of his son Jesus. That is what God's intent was for the cross of Christ. When sin entered humanity, relational disaster took place. Spiritual death set in and separated God from humanity and also caused a division between humanity itself. We can see this uh, through this verse. The prophet Isaiah says it this way in Isaiah 59 in verse 2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. The first thing we see is this. If there is any separation between us and God, the onus of that separation lies with us. Notice, notice what Isaiah said. He said, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. You see, God is the one who never changes. And God is the one whose love and faithfulness endures forever. Jesus is the one who is uh, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the one who said, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. Remember, we go back to Genesis chapter 3, and uh, there's the story there of the fall of humanity. And after the fall, God is the one calling out, Adam, where are you? Now, we all know God knew exactly where Adam was physically. He's probably hiding behind some tree with his wife. And uh, so that wasn't the intent of the question. The idea is this, Adam, where are you in relation to me? Something has happened in our relationship. It's been fractured. Where are you? And Adam says, well, I heard you walking in the cool of the day in the garden. And notice what he says. I was naked and afraid 
And so I hid myself. And then God confronts Adam and asked if he ate from the tree that he was commanded not to eat from. And Adam immediately shifts the blame from himself and he lays it on God and the woman. In other words, he simply says to God, you know, it was that woman that you gave me. In other words, if it wasn't for her and if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be in the mess that I'm in right now. So notice what happens in relationships when sin enters the picture. All of a sudden, there's fear, right? There's isolation, there's denial, and there's blame. The result is a breakdown in relationships. And isn't that what we find in society today? Someone said, we live in a culture that has elevated pride to the status of a virtue. Self-esteem, positive feelings, and personal dignity are what our society encourages people to seek. At the same time, listen now, moral responsibility is being replaced by victimism, which teaches people to blame someone else for their personal failures and iniquity. Nobody wants to take the responsibility anymore. It's always somebody else's fault, somebody else's problem. Goes on to say, frankly, the biblical teachings about sin and guilt, repentance and humility are not compatible with any of these ideas. The idea of conscience has vanished. How true is that? So what happened in the relationship between God, Adam and Eve? Instantly, that which was joined together by God has now been ruptured and torn apart by sin. From that moment on, relationships on all levels have been impacted by the sin issue. That is why the world is in the condition that it's in today. That is why the divorce rate, according to some researchers, is still at an all-time high, and Pew Research says that half of all marriages will end in divorce. That is why two-parent households, according to Pew Research, are on the decline in the U.S. That is why the current data suggests that 25% of teens experience some sort of anxiety disorder, such as phobias, panic disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. That is why the overall drug and alcohol use among young people have reached epidemic levels. And that is why the current race relations in the U.S. is still a major problem. Society is broken, shattered, damaged, and fractured by sin. The only cure is not legislation from Washington, but reconciliation from the cross of Jesus Christ. Say amen. If you want your marriage to be healed, come to the cross. If you want your children to be delivered, come to the cross. If you want your life to be redeemed, come to the cross. The cross of Christ is the place where reconciliation begins. To reconcile literally means to bring into agreement or harmony or to make compatible or consistent with one another. We find this in a familiar verse, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We start at verse 17. Paul says it this way, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, look, the new has come. All this is from God. In other words, you know, redemption was not man's idea. Redemption was God's idea. So Paul says, all of this comes from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us, look at this, the ministry of reconciliation. Do you know, if, you know that's your ministry, that's my ministry? We all have the ministry of reconciliation, telling others about Jesus so that they can put their faith and trust in Christ, receive forgiveness, and through Christ, they are reconciled together with God again. Paul goes on to say, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Look at this, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. 
What Paul is saying is that with this new life that we experience, Christians are not reformed, rehabilitated, or even re-educated. We are recreated and reconciled. Say amen to this. So why was this reconciliation necessary? Let's go back to our text, Romans chapter 5, and drill down into three important points that uh, the Apostle Paul uh, reveals to us why reconciliation was necessary. Number one, because we were weak. Take a look at Romans 5 and verse 6. It says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. This word weak means this, powerless, without strength, the inability of humanity to accomplish their own salvation. We couldn't heal ourselves or save ourselves or deliver ourselves. We needed uh, the giver of life to bring life, eternal life to us. And so we were weak. This means that we have no power within ourselves to bring ourselves in line with God. We are powerless to make ourselves right with God. We're like a cell phone with a dead battery. No matter how much you, you know, hit the screen or hit the buttons, the phone cannot plug itself in. It is without power and unable to do anything about it. This word weak means that we are unplugged from God and we cannot plug ourselves in on our own. Do you feel weak today, powerless unplugged from God. Maybe you feel God is distant to you. Then come to the cross and be reconciled today. Even as a believer, do you feel the inability to maintain the standard of holy living that God requires? You know, the apostle Paul felt this way. We read a portion of scripture here in Romans chapter seven. I think many of us can relate to this at some time in our walk with God. Romans chapter 7, starting at verse 15, Paul says this. I, I like the opening line. I think we could all relate to it. He says, for I do not understand my own actions. <laughs> Amen to that. There are times I don't understand what I do and why I do it. He goes on to say, I, I, I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Isn't that something? We can relate to that. We, we want to live godly, but we don't have the ability. We, we can't sometimes muster up our own strength to rise to God's standards. We need Christ. We need to be reconciled. And so he goes on to say in verse 19, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. You see, now he's re referring to a sin issue that sometimes drives him, causes him to do what he doesn't want to do. And so how do we get out of this? Well, he goes on to say, he gives us the answer. Look at uh, verse 24. He said, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Here it is. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. He delivers us from the body of this death. You know, we all live imperfect lives. Have you ever noticed those uh, dimples and dents covering the surface of a golf ball? They make the ball look imperfect. So what's their purpose? Well, an aeronautical engineer who designs the ball said that a perfectly smooth ball would travel only 130 yards off the tee. But the same ball with the right kind of dimples and dents will fly twice that far. These apparent imperfections minimize the ball's air resistance and allow it to travel much further. When you are able to reconcile your dimples and dents, your weaknesses and imperfections with God, he is then able to use those weaknesses to shape you and take you further than you would have been able to accomplish 
on your own. See, that's why Paul urges us. Once again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, he's like begging us. Notice what he says. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to come, be reconciled to God. He goes on to say in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, remember this, when Paul was, was struggling and God stepped in because of his own weaknesses and God stepped in and said, my grace is sufficient for you for my power, God said, is made perfect or allowed to run its full course is the true meaning there. My power is allowed to run its full course, notice, in weakness. You see, when we take our, our weaknesses, our imperfections, and, you know, we, we bring them to God, we recognize we, we can't do this on our own. I need Jesus in my life. I need his power. I need his blood. I need his forgiveness. I, I need the Holy Spirit's guidance. I need the word, his promises. When we realize we can't live this life on our own and, and come up to the standard of God, we then, we then take our weaknesses and we bring them to God, and that puts us in a position of being vulnerable before God, and we say, we pray, Lord, search me and try me and prove me and see if there's any wicked thing in me. Change me, mold me into the person that you want me to be. I don't want to be conformed to this world. Lord, I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind, and when we take our stuff and we bring it to God, that's when God says, my power is allowed to run its full course when you surrender to me. Isn't that something? So reconciliation was necessary, number one, because we were weak. Number two, Paul says we were ungodly. Go back to Romans 5, look at verse 6. He says, for while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Ungodly means that we were destitute of reverential awe toward God. We were, what that really means is this, we were condemning God. We were, we were in a battle with God. The ungodly are always in conflict with God. Our actions and our lives are marked by characteristics that we are opposed to what God desires for us. It's more than just being irreligious. It's acting in conflict with or to dispute or to contradict God's moral law. The ungodly fight against God and against relationship with God. They don't want to hear it and they don't want to give their lives to God. They're in constant battle. Well, Paul addresses this and shows us why the, the law of God was given, the word of God was given. Why we have God's thought on this and, and how God encourages us to align our lives with his truth. He says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 9, he says, understanding this, that the law, listen to this, is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and the disobedient. Now, we know that to be true even in our civil laws today, right? We are a country of laws. The laws are not laid down for the just or those who uh, obey the law. The law is laid down for the disobedient, the criminals, right? Well, God's law has been laid down for the same reason. He goes on to say, uh, well, let me begin again. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexual, uh, sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers and liars and perjurers. And, you know, if you know, your particular sin wasn't listed, and then he says this, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. That's why God's law was given. Someone said, who does God justify through faith? the ungodly. Who did Christ die for? The ungodly. That means those without God, the ungodly. 
Why does God justify the ungodly? Why did Christ die for the ungodly? Because that's the only kind of person there was, the ungodly. So reconciliation was necessary for those who are ungodly without God in this world. But wait a minute. What about those who are godly? In other words, who have God in their life, but act at times in ungodly ways. Is reconciliation also for them? Notice every one of those acts of ungodliness in the verse that we just read was against relationship with God or against relationship with another. Has your recent actions or behaviors been marked by characteristics that oppose God's will for your life, his moral law, or his standard for living? If so, then you have been acting in ungodly ways. So what's going on here? If Satan can get you, listen now, to reject your relationship with Christ, his only move then is to try to rupture your relationship with Christ. And so he will tempt you to act in ungodly ways. And if he can get you to do that consistently, your relationship with Christ will break down and you will be without power and victory in life. You'll be in bondage. Every act of ungodliness you commit toward God or others requires an act of reconciliation on your part. You can't just walk away and think that God's grace is going to somehow, you know, cover your ungodliness without repentance on your part, seeking to make it right between God and others. You know, there are some people that live that way. You know, they, they hurt others, they wound others, they sin against God, and they simply walk away, take no responsibility, and they say something like, well, uh, it'll be covered by the blood of Jesus. That's nonsense. Jesus said it this way in the Sermon on the Mount, that he, as he's dealing with the hearts of men in that sermon. And, and he says this in Matthew chapter 5. Remember this? Look at this. He said, uh, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you. Look at what Jesus says. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, that, that shows us uh, how intimate God is, Jesus is, with his body. We are the body of Christ. He's the head. We are the body. If we are acting in ungodly ways with one another, if there is arguing and strife and unforgiveness and, and we're wounding one another, we can't simply ignore that and then go to God and sing our worship songs and praise and offer him our gift. God is saying, don't even bother with that because I'm not involved in that. Why? You, you, are, you are against someone I love. You are against your brother and your sister in the body of Christ. He says, what you do is you leave your gift right there at the altar and you, and you go and you try to reconcile uh, with your brother or your sister. Why is that so important? Because your fractured, unreconciled relationship with your brother or sister in Christ has a di direct impact on your relationship with God. So he says, you got to go get this thing fixed. And, and so what do we do? We, we make an effort, right? How many of you know love takes the first step? And uh, in the name of love, which is really the foundation of our belief system, we, we go and we try to reconcile. And um, we make an effort because we know it's the right thing to do. And uh, then we come back to God and then we could offer our gift in worship before God. Jesus uh, said it this way in Matthew 25, remember? 
Verse 40, he says, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. There we see again, Jesus is closely connected to his body. How we treat one another impacts our relationship with Christ. So the principle still stands, how we manage our relationship with one another. If we do it in love, then we're able to be open and free and vulnerable before God and worship God. There's communion with God. But if we don't do it, if we ignore that, then um, all of a sudden it feels like heaven is brass. And when we pray, we don't sense his presence. Our faith feels weak. And uh, many times it's because, you know, we have all of this unforgiveness and bitterness and maybe hatred, offense toward other people. How many of you know the Bible says this, that faith works by love? That's what Jesus is talking about here. So uh, can't you see this, that, you know, the, the Bible says that the devil is called the accuser of the brethren. So what does he seek to do? Well, he seeks to fracture your relationship with others with the hope of weakening your relationship with God, right? If he can, if he can get you to be, you know, angry at other people and bitter and have unforgiveness in your heart, then he knows he can weaken your relationship with God. Jesus said it this way, right? You know this, a house divided cannot stand. That's why Peter picked up on that in 1 Peter chapter 3. Remember, he was talking about husbands and wives, and he said this, for you to live together in an understanding way so that your prayers may not be hindered. I mean, we're seeing it everywhere in the scripture. We've got to get this thing right. We can't, we can't walk around in our home and let it fall apart and have disagreement and, and, um, and, and arguing and anger and bitterness and unforgiveness and think we're going to pray in power? You're kidding yourself. You see, our prayers are going to be hindered. Why? Once again, faith works by love. And so what is more important uh, it, it's more important to get into agreement than it is to appear justified. And so we got to get this thing right. Every act of reconciliation requires repentance and forgiveness. So, so why does Satan hate the cross so much? Well, because it's the, it's the cross that has the power to bring together that which otherwise could not be together. That's the power of the cross, the power of reconciliation. Reconciliation was necessary because we were ungodly. And finally, reconciliation was necessary because we were sinners, right? Paul says in Romans 5, chapter, uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, he said, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So let's drill down just a little bit and unpack this concept of sin. What is sin? Well, sin is always against God first. It's always against God first. Sin is anything, whether in thought, action, or attitude, that is in opposition to God's word, his will, his moral law, or his character. Let me say it again. Sin is anything, whether in thought, action, or attitude, that is in opposition of God's word, God's will, God's moral law, or God's character. As sinners, we are constantly missing the mark of God's standard. The idea is being devoted to sin, preeminently sinful, living in willful rebellion against God, opposing his standards. In other words, we do wrong, we continue to do wrong, even though we know it's wrong, like we don't care. We're just going to sin. Are we living in willful rebellion against God, opposing his intent for our lives? If so, then there is a separation 
as I read earlier, in our, rela- in our relationship and reconciliation is necessary. So what does Christ do for the weak, the ungodly, and the sinner? Well, Christ died for us. Once again, let's take a look. Paul says, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Notice this act was not a demonstration of power or majesty or might. It was simply a demonstration of love and grace. For by grace you have been saved, Paul said, and that not of yourself. It's it's through faith, that not of yourself. Um, It's not by your works, lest any man should boast. It is the free gift of God, this salvation. Jesus said this, remember in John 15, verse 13, he says, greater love is no man than this, that a man or someone lay down his life for his friends. John 3, 16, you know this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You see, Christ died for us. 1 John 3, 16, by this we know love. John is saying, we can see what love is. We can understand what love is. By this, we know love that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for one another. God's love, you know, is still available for all who will accept Christ and what he's done on the cross of Calvary. There is no merit on our part. In other words, you can't be good enough or righteous enough to save yourself. See, it's not by works. We see that in Ephesians 2.8. Paul said it's not by works. Uh, you, you've been saved by grace. It's a gift from God. It's, it's not by works lest any man should boast. How many of you reconcile your checkbook? I'm sure many of us do, whether you do it online or whether you do it with your physical statement, the process is really the same. On one side, you you have your statement, and on the other side, you have your check register. And your job is to bring all of your stuff in line with the bank statement. You know what that makes you? The reconciler. As reconciler, we sit in the middle and we bring our stuff in line with the bank. Well... On the cross, as reconciler, Jesus is in the middle between us and God. And through his shed blood, he brings our stuff in line with God's demands and requirements. We no longer have to be isolated from God. We can now have a meaningful relationship with God through his son, Jesus. We can come to the throne room of grace boldly to obtain mercy in our time of need. And through his power and love, we can can be reconciled with other people. Not only that, we also have security. Now we have security forever because of what Jesus did on the cross of Christ. You know, uh, Paul said in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14, that sin Because of what Jesus did, because God raised him from the dead, the Bible says there that we now have the ability to walk in newness of life. And then Paul says, sin no longer has dominion over you. Praise God. We can walk free. Why? We've been reconciled. We've been brought into harmony with God through the cross of Jesus Christ. And you know, his reconciliation is binding. He promised that when you confess your sin, and you know, we all make mistakes. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when we sin, when we can make a mistake and uh, we've uh, displeased God uh, in some way, John says we confess our sin in 1 John 1, 9. We can confess our sin and he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he does it instantly. Why? Because of reconciliation, because of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. He paid your price. He paid my price. And um, because of that, 
God uh, forgives because Jesus paid the price. Amen. And so he now gives us an opportunity to be saved, healed, delivered, and forgiven. What the weak could not do, Jesus did for us. What the ungodly could not do, Jesus did for us. What the sinner could not do, Jesus did for us. Through the cross, he connected God and humanity. That was God's intent for the cross of Christ, reconciliation. So what do we do? How do we be reconciled? Three very simple but very important steps. Number one, we repent of our sins. We recognize that, you know what? Maybe I'm ungodly, I'm a sinner. I need to come to Christ. I need to repent of my sins. And so that's number one. Number two, I then put my trust in Christ as my savior. And then number three, I receive my forgiveness. You see, it's, it's a, a simple process, but do it from the heart. And when we recognize the power of the cross and what Christ did there, not the wooden beam itself, but what Christ did on the cross of Calvary, uh, it's far reaching. And if we submit and we open up our hearts and we become vulnerable and we recognize that we've got to get in line with God and we're sinners, we repent, we trust Jesus, we receive our forgiveness, we have eternal life. Would you pray with me right now? Let's go to God together. There may be some, I'm sure there are, who need to be reconciled with God, maybe for the very first time. And then there are others who, we struggle with an ungodly life. We need to go to God right now. And uh, maybe you're not happy the way you've been treating others. Maybe in your home, maybe outside your home. And we need to go to God right now. Let's reconcile. Let's confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Uh, we honor you that you've loved us so much. You love the world so much. You gave us Jesus. And he came and he represented you and he gave us your word and showed us your love. And he died on the cross of Calvary. He paid, he paid the price for all of our sins. And so, Father, we recognize that we've been ungodly. We recognize, Lord, that we're sinners. And we confess our sin to you right now. We ask you, Lord, Forgive me of my sin. I trust Christ as my Lord and Savior. Father, I know on the third day you raised him from the dead and your word says if you raised Christ from the dead, then um, as we put our faith in him, we have been raised into newness of life. And so I thank you, Lord, for giving me new life today. Old things pass away and behold, all things become new. So Father, thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for reconciling me through your son, Jesus. And Lord, I commit myself to you. I wanna live for Jesus every day of my life. Father, I pray this prayer with all of my heart in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining with me today. If you prayed that prayer for the first time and you gave your heart to Jesus today for the first time, let us know. Let us know in the comments. We want to be able to reach out to you and help you uh, in your walk with Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining with me, all of you, uh, as we celebrate Palm Sunday today. And uh, of course, we have Good Friday coming up and then Easter Sunday. Uh, thanks for joining with us again in this service. You know, throughout the week, we have other uh, means of activities and fellowship. We have uh, midweek service and, you know, other uh, Zoom meetings that connect us, you know, one to another. And then right back here once again on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. So thank you. Listen, lift your hands up before we close. Let me pray for each and every one of you. And now may the Lord bless you 
May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. And may God be gracious to you and grant you peace that passes all understanding in Jesus' name. And listen, don't forget to share the program. Subscribe uh, wherever you're viewing us and uh, get it out there. Share this program with your family and your friends. Amen. God bless you. Have a blessed day in Jesus. I am thirsty, hungry, desperate for your presence. 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 Let there be less of me, more of you, less of me, more of you. Let there be less of me, more of you, less of me, more of you. I am thirsty. Let there be, let there be less of me, more of you, less of me, more of you. Let there be less of me, more of you, less of me, more of you. Let there be less of me, more of you, less of me, more of you. Let there be less of me, more of you, less of me. We just honor you and bless you, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for this service. We thank you that we could all gather together and worship you and lift up the name of Jesus simply because you deserve it. You deserve it, Lord. You deserve all of our praise. We thank you for sending your son to us. Lord, as we enter into Holy Week, I thank you, Lord, that our eyes will be fixed on what Jesus has done for us your sacrifice, taking our place so that we may live and we may know you, Lord, and be in reconciliation with you. And I thank you, Father God, that each and every one of us will come to the truth of the gospel. We honor you, we bless you, and we praise you. And church, if you agree in Jesus' name, say amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for joining us on this Palm Sunday. Uh, we have Good Friday service coming up. And please join us next week, next Sunday, for our Easter service. Have a great week.